Rarely do we discover a worthy artist who works alone and unheralded. Arthur Penagian was one of them. He drew and painted in obscurity until his death in 1999 and age of 85. To our knowledge, no articles were written about Pinagian, and he exhibited and sold his paintings only rarely. Despite this neglect, he pursued his art steadfastly and with incredible determination. Starting in the 1890s and lasting to the late 1920s, more than 100,000 Armenian Christians fled to America as a result of prosecution by Turkish Muslims. The worst horror began in 1915 with methodically launched genocide that claimed more than one and a half million Armenian lives. Arthur Penagian was a child of two of the survivors. His parents, Hakop and Vartanush, married soon after their arrival in Union City, New Jersey, around 1910. Arthur was born on March 28, 1914. By the time Arthur Penagian graduated high school in 1930s at age of 16, the Great Depression was on the way. In 1932, the misery in Penagian's household was exasperated by his mother's death. Pinagian moved with his father and sister to a smaller apartment, warmed only by a pot belly stove. As a professional comic book illustrator, Pinagian must be counted as among the medium's pioneers, for he found considerable success in writing and drawing for a number of comic book publishers, notably his Hooded Justice in 1939 and Madame Fatale in 1940. However, Pinagian's work in comic books was interrupted in 1943 when he was drafted to the U.S. Army during World War II. As a U.S. serviceman, Pinagian took part in a terrible Battle of Bulge, and for his stellar service, he was awarded a Bronze Star for his action. After returning from World War II, Pinagian rejected commercial art and committed himself to pursue of serious painting. Why he had managed to save some money from his years as comic book illustrator, it was his sister Armen who supported him. The majority of Pinagian's work was found after his death, stacked up in one car garage and attic of his sister's property. Along with the art were found his journals, many letters, and sketchbooks that span 50 years of his creative life. Today, the newly discovered Pinagian collection is valued for millions of dollars and generates interest from major galleries and museums from around the world. Recently, Voice of Armenians TV New York sat down for an interview with Thomas Schultz, executive director and chief curator at Gallery 125. He shared with us his incredible story of a chance find that changed his life and brought the works of this remarkable artist to the world stage. We're here at the Gallery 125. Thomas, thank you very much for hosting us here. It's wonderful to be in this beautiful space. I want to start our conversation by asking you about the story of how you came about the work of Mr. Arthur Pinagian. So we're in Gallery 125, which was a gallery I opened approximately five years ago after I discovered Pinagian's works. Pinagian lived in Belport Village from 1973 until his death in 1999. It wasn't until his sister Almond died in 2006 that the little cottage became available on the real estate market. With the purposes of putting it back on the market in order to make a profit in the, what was a hot real so estate market. So you were in real estate at the time? Not really. I was, I'm, I'm an entrepreneur. I've always been in my own businesses. And we've, uh, my partner, my business partner, Lawrence Joseph from California, decided that it was prudent to maybe also ride that wave of the real estate uh, bubble. Um, little do we know that as soon as we acquired the Panagian Cottage, the, the, the crash would occur mm -hmm. and uh, the Great Recession would begin. Um, so we never sold the Panagian Cottage, but little did we know that in the smallest cottage on Long Island, which is only 625 square feet, what would be the most important, most significant art find in American contemporary art. It's absolutely remarkable. So you, you see this cottage, you guys decide to to buy it, to turn it into, make some profit out of it, and then what happens? So I walk into the cottage during one of my first previews of the cottage, and I notice in the back garage and in the attic there, there was a tremendous amount of art, original art created by one man, based on the, the signature, and it spanned over 60 years based on the dates. And I knew immediately that I was looking at someone's life's work. Um, it wasn't until a year later when we put the work in front of uh, scholars and historians that we realized there was any value to the collection. But at that moment when I first saw it, I, I knew it was someone's life's work and someone's passion. And uh, I wasn't going to be the one to put it into the dumpster that was waiting outside. 
the uh, owners of the house or the family uh, didn't know what to do with this large body of artwork. Um, so it was left in the garage when the house went onto the real estate market. And um, they never discarded it, luckily. And when I came onto the scene and we were interested in the cottage, they suggested that we throw everything that was in the garage, which included other items such as old dressers and boxes and, and other things that you would find in the house. We asked the family if they had any interest in it, and they said, well, we have 100 pieces of art from, from the artists, and what do you do with 7,000 or so? Uh, luckily, we came onto the scene, and we had the ability, the means, and the desire to do something with it. And when we did go back to it six or seven months later, after we renovated the cottage, we realized we had journals and diaries and notes, and we had work spanning 60 years, and um, we had the artist's uh, World War II medals and uh, all sorts of personal effects. Uh, so we had a complete body of work, including all the personal items that go along with that. It's truly a fascinating story. Um, I'm curious when you walked in into that attic or a garage, when, where was the moment of that little aha, when you felt like you were looking at something that has a, a true cultural significance? My first instinctive reaction was that this was someone's life's work. And my, my thoughts went back to my father, who died in 1992. And when he died, there was really not much except my memories of him remaining. So here I am in front of someone's life's work, who I found out passed away in Arthur Panagian. He passed away in 1999. Here is an opportunity to save uh, someone's life's work. And so I thought it was my duty to do so. I also thought the art was excellent. I, I'm a fan of abstraction. Um, I always liked abstract expressionism. In the 1940s and 50s, New York became the art capital of the world because of the abstract expressionist movement, and it took the spotlight off Paris. Mm -hmm. And I recognized right away from the dates I was looking at works from that, that yeah. period. So now you get back to it, you realize you have something significant, and you bring in professionals to give you an idea of what is it that you have, and then you receive a news of what is it? We decided to rent two little loca locations uh, uh, across the street from the Patrick Theater in Patrog, and we start to spread out the collection. I and I, I hired a couple of helpers to help uh, unroll the canvases, which were tied up with string. And what was interesting, they were when Panagian put them away, he would layer the canvases, five or six layers of canvas, and he would roll them tightly and tie them off with string. So when you snip the string, um, and try to unroll the canvases, the canvases just wanted to roll back, almost like a spring. Yeah. And it took months for them to relax and settle. We had to use weights. and So there was a four or five or six months of just getting the collection open. And at times, spiders would crawl out, and uh, some of the works on paper that were moldy and moist were, were set up so that they would dry. And at, at that moment, that first uh, adventure into the collection was... was was emotional. Oh, I'm sure. I was actually thinking that because you are unraveling somebody's life in essence. That's right. Yeah. And uh, at the time, I was trying to place works by chronologically, mm -hmm. the earliest works to the left, the the works from the 1970s over here, the works from the 1990s. So I was getting a sense of the evolution of the artist. The next step after we allowed the collection to breathe was to find someone who knew a lot more about art and art history. Uh, and to convince them to come in and take a peek. Because we were convinced, my partner and I, Lawrence Joseph, we were convinced that we had something very important. Luckily, I knew someone, a good friend of mine, Jim Daytree. His sister was married to Professor William Innes Homer, who is one of the most respected art historians when it comes to American contemporary art post-World War II, which is basically where this collection sits. And he reluctantly decided to do his brother-in-law a favor and look at 300 images of the artwork which I went about taking up in the studio. And uh, within a couple of weeks he reported back to us that he was very curious as to what we had and he wanted to see everything. And he spent nine months to a year looking at all the artwork. We shipped work down to him. He read the journals, the diaries, the notes. And eventually, he sent a report back to us saying that there is something very important in front of us on multiple levels. One, that it was a complete uh, evolution of an artist laid out in front of us. You could see Panagian's studies, his failures, his masterpieces, his philosophy, and his journals and diaries. 
And Professor Homer said that doesn't exist. You don't see the evolution of an artist laid out like this. And he said one of the most important aspects of this collection is that it is together and that it is intact. And you just, you're not seeing a um, curated portion of the collection like you do when you see de Kooning or Picasso. You see their best works. You don't see their studies leading up to the masterpieces. So from a scholarly point of view, you were able to explore the evolution of an artist spending over 60 years. Yeah. And, and he said, volume of work, just volume of work on its own. I mean, what is it, seven? What's the number? So, yeah, and part of that process of opening up the collection, we uh, went right to work indexing it, putting an index number on every work. And in the end, we, um, we, we um, cataloged almost 7,000 pieces of art, which includes the quick pen sketches, which are hundreds and hundreds of pen sketches. And, and it includes the large canvases from the 1950s and the smaller canvases from the 1980s. So, over almost 7,000 pieces of artwork. I'm just imagining 7,000 pieces of artwork. Um, that's a tremendous amount of dedication, drive, uh, and a love of painting, uh, perhaps more than anything else. Considering the fact that this artist worked alone, uh, had no non-exhibitions, perhaps some small things, but nothing major, and certainly didn't try to compete uh, didn't try to put himself out there, his name out there, and just paint it. In addition to being an incredibly talented painter, he was a, an accomplished comic book uh, cartoonist. That's right. And he was a decorated war hero. That's right. Uh, so we are talking about someone who's quite remarkable. Tell me a little bit about this artist. What do you know about him? During the process of discovering this collection, I was intrigued with the man, Arthur Panagian. Who was he? Where was he from? Luckily, the family and many family members from different sides of the family were willing to collaborate with us and to share information about Arthur Panagian, whose uh, Armenian name is Ashad, uh, Ashad Panagian, uh, known, um, known as also Art, Art Panagian. In the 1930s, um, he was a very successful comic book illustrator, and he was in high demand. In fact, he could have made a fortune in that field if he stayed in it. Um, the comic books came of age in the 1950s, but Panagian rejected that commercialism. And uh, from letters and, and, and his journals, we sense that he didn't want to create on a timeline or a time schedule. Uh, he didn't want to be in demand. Um, he didn't want to deal with the business end of art or the pressures related to having to make a deadline. And so after World War II, where he was decorated, a decorated soldier. He received the Bronze Star of Valor in the Battle of the Bulge. After returning home um, uh, in, from Europe, he joined the Art Student League and never went back to commercial illustration in the 1940s. And he started creating large canvases in the early 40s and right through the 40s and 50s. He was hanging out with a lot of famous artists at the time, William de Kooning, Jackson Pollock, Mark Rothko, Clifford Still, uh, he knew them, he hung out in their inner circle, but unlike them, he wasn't a drinker or a partier. He would just simply um, sketch while they were drinking, say, in Greenwich Village. Unlike them, he did not have a gallery. He was simply painting and putting the painting aside. And it's just another example of him just rejecting commercialism. You know, there's also a, a character of his sister, someone who supported him. Right. Someone who was there to provide an environment for him to work. Do, what do we know about her? So uh, Armin and, and Arthur Panagian lived together their whole lives for the most part. It's just the whole thing is remarkable. I mean, every aspect of this story, one after another, is remarkable. It's simply remarkable. In this day and age, in 21st century, to hear this kind of pure, untouched story of... of of an artist, please continue. Certainly, and there is a, one of the questions that I'm often asked is how did he how did he support himself? And the answer is his sister. She's the hero. She paid the bills. She and he lived together their whole lives. She died. Um, he uh, Panagian died in 1999, and and Arm and his sister died in 2006. Um, they lived together mostly their whole lives with with uh, Armin holding a nine to five job and paying the bills allowing her brother to simply paint. And she was his number one fan. She, we know from his writings and from family interviews 
that she thought his work was phenomenal and she was willing to take it to the galleries and show the works in New York and, and she did but she didn't have success and she wasn't really supported by her brother he simply didn't want to even think about the idea of hooking up with a gallery and trying to show his work he did show his works at little art, art uh, fairs in Woodstock, New York um, and he would write in his journals that uh, he sold a painting for $200 and he took the $200 and went out and he bought more canvas yeah. and um, but uh, if it, there was a, it, it, it appears from his writings that if there was a lot of stress and anxiety with the, the business end of art, he just put that aside and went to paint. And um, it's a privilege for me to be able to expose his great work to the world, uh, always keeping in mind um, what he would have wanted. I find myself in a position um, of doing that for him now. And uh, each time we have an opening reception of his works, I, I imagine him being there where um, he, he might be just sitting quietly in a corner and not wanting the attention, yeah. um, but pleased that his work is getting the critical recognition that it certainly deserves. I feel it's, 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 a, it's a gift that I have been given to bring his works to uh, the public and to the world. And do we know what, what he wanted to do with the paintings towards the end of his life? Yeah. In his final decade of life in the 1990s, um, when his sister would ask, um, you know, what are we going to do with your collection? He would tell her, simply throw it out. Throw it in the dumpster. It's, just throw it out. And, and we know from Pete Najarian, a cousin from uh, Berkeley, California, that that, uh, that was more out of frustration and... Uh, um, just not knowing what to say, what to do. Um, he thought he was the next Picasso. He thought his works were better than, say, William de Kooning. In fact, he writes in his diary that he went to visit uh, a gallery where William de Kooning, his good friend, was having a show at the Fuller Building. And uh, he comes out of that show saying his works are better than his friend William de Kooning's work. Uh, a famous art critic, John Perrault, writes in an essay that um, unlike his more famous peers, because Panagian decided not to jump into the marketplace, his work evolved differently. His work wasn't created to make a dollar. His work was created just to express himself and just to, to lay down on canvas or on paper his emotion, where some of his other more famous peers, they always had the dollar sign as they were creating his, their works. And, and the art was possibly different because of that. And so we have a good example of it, an artist who, who simply created to create and not to, to make a fortune. Listening to you, I'm realizing that in many ways, you yourself uh, bended the destiny of this artist by discovering his work, by saving his work. But in many ways, also, this artist has bended the destiny of yours. That's right. And I find that quite fascinating. Because right now we are sitting at your gallery, um, and while you were an entrepreneur, I'm sure that having a gallery was not perhaps part of the business plan. But here we are in this magnificent space, and I'm listening to your eloquent and beautiful uh, conversation about this artist. Tell me how he influenced you. I'm driven by him. I am inspired by him. I, I always think about how he would wake up every day and the first thing he would do is, is simply go, go about his painting. I find myself waking up each day and the first thing I think about is what can I do to, to, to ensure that the legacy of Arthur Panagian is cemented in art history. And for seven years I've been doing that. And I like to say that I've been Panagian in that that's what he did. He focused on what he wanted to do. And I'm focused on what I want to do, and that is to ensure that his work is shared with the world, and that his works appear on museum walls, and that, that, the, that, that the critical recognition that we know he wanted, he'll receive. And, and we have succeeded at that. Major museums have acquired his work. Major collectors are flying in from around the world to look at his work, and then they too acquire. So ironically, whenever we do sell a work or whenever... A, a collector acquires the work. It, it, it's almost a painful experience in that that one work now leaves the collection, 
And, and maybe in a way, Panagian had the same feelings and maybe that's one of the reasons why he didn't want to sell his... Because a, a painting is, from what I understand, an artist who creates a painting, it's like one of their children. And so maybe he didn't want to sell them because he couldn't part with them, although he wanted to be on museum walls. Um, so I find myself um, focused on how do I save the legacy of a truly gifted man with a lot of help. We have a team of experts and scholars that uh, uh, collaborate with us and, and, and show us the, the way forward as how to go about um, bringing this man's work to museums. And so we have succeeded at that. But Panagian um, has influenced my life dramatically. It's, it's been a life-changing situation for me on multiple levels. Um, we are, we have decided to sell a certain number of works in order to support the project. There's a, a tremendous amount of labor involved in, in preserving the works, cataloging the, the works, digitizing the works, ensuring that the journals are scanned so that people 100 years from now would be able to read his writings. Um, we're doing everything we can here in Belport to keep the collection intact while raising trying to raise enough money to support that project. Um, but each time a major museum or an institution acquires a Panagian, it gives me great gratitude and, and, and I get great uh, satisfaction at knowing that this fine piece of work will now always be in the public domain where others will see it and my, my daughters will grow up and see this great piece of artwork that their father helped save from the dumpster. and. Um, so I, I, I am inspired by uh, those, those types of um, conclusions um, as it relates to the work I do now. So every morning I wake up, I walk in his footsteps. Mm. And I open my own gallery. We say here in Gallery 125 is no more Panagians, meaning no more unknown artists, no more artists that are working hard, creating great work without getting the recognition that they seek or deserve. So my gallery becomes a, a, a vehicle for other artists to show what they're doing. In a way, Panagian is supporting this gallery. His, the, the, supporting the, other artists. So, right, he's supporting other artists. A large percentage of the proceeds from that will go to support the project, this gallery, which is in return supporting other artists. And I think Panagian would be very thrilled with that, uh, with that concept, with that model. Thomas, this was truly a remarkable conversation. Uh, it has inspired me as much as it has inspired you. It's wonderful to see that this gallery serves other artists. It's wonderful to see your enthusiasm about the art, about what you do now, about the, the shape that your life has taken. Um, I also want to speak to our audience directly. This is an opportunity to contact the gallery. If you are interested in the work of Mr. Panagian, um, this is our compatriot. This is one of a kind story. This is a one of a kind artist. And uh, perhaps by expressing your interest, uh, you will become part of uh, history. I think that would be a fair thing to say. Uh, Thomas, thank you so much. Thank you for having us in our gallery and best of luck to you. Thank, thank you. you. My great pleasure. Thank, thank you. you. At the end of our conversation, Thomas Schultz took us on a small tour of his Gallery 125, where most of Panagian's work is being held. This is the storage room at Gallery 125. Uh, this room is dedicated mostly to storing Panagian's body of artwork. Uh, since the original discovery, we have indexed and photographed every piece of artwork, and we place them in archival boxes in order to ensure that they remain state in stable condition. And for example, um, here's a, an archival box of works on paper. And you can see um, this is a work that was created probably in the 1960s. You can see it's oil on paper. And it's just a fabulous uh, um, example of an abstraction or an abstract landscape. It's possible that there is a foreground here and a background. Um, Panagian would create artwork on anything he could get his hands on, including newspaper. Here's an example of a piece of newspaper, I believe it's the New York Times, where there's an abstract design that he created on the actual newspaper, and this is dated 1976. But we have hundreds and hundreds and thousands of works on paper that are in different boxes according to size and date. Here's a lovely uh, abstraction. 
an abstract design. This is dated 1968, actually February 26, 1968. Each time I go into one of these archival boxes, it's just to me like rediscovering the works all over again. The second floor um, is dedicated to Panagian. This is the location or the area in the gallery where we stage uh, all the exhibitions that take place around the world. Uh, all the works are processed here. They're packed and they ship from this location. And here's a good example of a work that we just got back from the conservator. This is an early work created um, in 1959. And it's a more representational scene in that it captures a little valley and some mountaintops and some trees to the left. And this is part of what we call Panagian's black period, where black was the dominant color in these paintings. And this black period lasted for four or five years. And if I turn this painting around, you'll see a wonderful uh, great big Panagian signature with a date of a work that Panagian would create. And this is more of an abstract geometric abstraction, not as representational as the work we just saw. There's nothing here that would suggest that this is a landscape. It's more of a geometric abstraction, more of an abstract expressionist type work. Uh, after the, the, this, uh, the initial discovery, not only did we invite scholars and historians to come look at the work, but we also invited gallery owners from New York City. And one particular gallerist, Iris Spanyaman, a very famous gallerist from New York City, came out to look at the Panagian collection. And this was one of the works he uh, pulled out and suggested that it was the strongest work that he had seen that day. And um, he later sent back representatives from his gallery and they made an offer to buy the entire collection outright from us for a rather large sum of money. But we knew that if we were to sell the collection that it would be um, separated and sold off to collectors around the world and it would never be together again. So we, we declined to uh, take his offer. But this was a work that he thought was one of the strongest works that, that he saw. It's an early um, abstraction dated 1962 and it happens to be one of my favorites as well. As a remarkable twist of faith, Thomas Schultz and his family currently reside in a very same cottage where Pinajan lived and worked. When I first came to see this property um, seven years ago, I was approaching this structure here, which is the garage. And then there was a, a door that would slide down that was off its track and I couldn't get in. And I had to literally force it open and I crawled underneath. And that's where all the art, most of the art was discovered. And it's since been renovated, but I'll take you into the space because it is a really special place. It was in this part of the garage, in the back portion, right in this corner, where all the works were stacked about this high. The works on paper were stacked in multiple stacks and some of them were tipped over and it was all on a dirt floor. The roof was leaking, there was water running down the walls and it was full of mildew and dirt and dust. And um, But within that was this great treasure trove of a man's life's work. And uh, it was in this room at this very location where I decided that this life's work, this man's life's work had to be preserved because of simply that it was his life's work. You can see the, the water damage on the roof of the, of the roof that was leaking, the cobweb. So this is how the, the, play, uh, the space would have looked when I first came into it. If you look over here, a piece of wood plank, and then he use that plank to create some type of um, shelving system on the wall here. It's upside down, but you can see some figurative drawings on there. 26 years in this space, he would often uh, tack his canvas up on the wall and he would paint on, on the wall as his easel. Neighbors would, uh, neighbors have come up to me and said, oh, I remember it was four o'clock in the morning and I looked through the window and there the artist was painting away. So we know from, um, from uh, the neighbors that all they remember of him was he was always painting. As they walked by the cottage, they saw him painting.
painting at all hours of the day. When my partner and I decided to sell the house on the market, we decided to paint everything white. So when it came time to paint this floor white, realizing that this is where the artist created most of his works and that was full of paint splatters, I decided I couldn't paint the whole floor white. That I had to leave some windows uh, looking into the original floor where you can see the original paint splatters that Panagian created while he was painting. In reading Panagian's journals, we know that his favorite painting spot at the Belport Cottage was behind the garage. This is the garage where the work was stored, but he would paint at this location right here. And he would paint the landscape in front of us. In fact, that painting inside is uh, from this vantage point, but this is like sacred ground once again, right here. Today, thanks to an effort of Thomas Schultz and his team, Pinagian's work generates interest from biggest art galleries and museums of New York and around the world. 